Good evening, church, and thank you so much for choosing to be a part of our time of study this evening. Uh, as always, it's my hope and prayer that this time can be edifying for you, that it can be encouraging for you, and that it can help to build up a you in your faith. I have a question that I want to ask to you right now, and I want you to be really honest with yourself in answering this question. Are you struggling in sin right now? Is there a sin or a set of sins that ha has overcome you? Is there something that is getting in the way of you and your relationship with God? Is your relationship with God where it needs to be right now? Or is there something that's getting in the way of that? Are you struggling with sin right now? If the answer to that question is yes... I want to provide some encouragement to you. Tonight in our study, I want to encourage you to help you to get through that, to help you to overcome that. And if your answer is no, and I hope it, that it is, if your answer is no, do you remember a time when you did have that feeling? Where you were full of sin, where sin was separating you from God, where your relationship was not where it needed to be with Him? You see, at some point or another in our walks on this earth, in, our running, in running our race of faith, sin, we inevitably encounter sin. And many times that sin overtakes us even to the point where we feel like that there is no way out, where we feel like that that sin it has a hold of us and there's nothing that we can ever do. You see, one of the absolute worst things about sin is that when it becomes a part of our lives, when we fall into sin, it takes control of us and it doesn't want to let go. And that sin, it inevitably puts a roadblock between me and God. It doesn't allow me to have the relationship with God that I need to have so long as it has control over me. Sin not only keeps me from having the relationship with God that I want to have, but it gets in the way of my work for His church. It gets, sin gets in the way of the unity of the church. Sin gets in the way of friendships. It gets in the way of families. It gets in the way of marriages. Sin, if it goes unchecked, if we allow ourselves to continually be controlled by sin, to continually be controlled by Satan, and those things go unchecked, then sin wreaks havoc on us as humans. Sin is destructive, and the truth is, it's really, really difficult to overcome. Because like I said, sin is powerful, and once it takes control over us, it doesn't want to let go. And so sin inevitably becomes really, really difficult to overcome. So what is it about sin that makes it so difficult? What is it that makes it so destructive and so difficult to overcome? Well, for one, when Satan tempts us with sin, what he's really doing is he's tempting us with our own desires. James, in his book in the New Testament, talks about our temptation, talks about that, and he says, and I want you to listen really closely to what he says in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Listen to what he says about our temptations. He says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do you understand what James is saying there? Each person is tempted when? When he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That's, that's what he says. That's how he says sin comes about. He says that we are enticed, we are lured by our own desire. You know, back in Genesis chapter 3, in the story of the fall of man, the first sin with Adam and Eve, Scripture tells us something about Satan. He tells us something about the character of Satan, about who he is. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, Scripture tells us, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. Scripture tells us that Satan is crafty. What does it mean that Satan is crafty? What is the craftiness of the devil? What makes him so crafty? To me, the craftiness of Satan is seen in what we see in James chapter 1. Satan knows our desires, and when he tempts us, he tempts us with things we want to do. 
Satan takes sin and he makes it look appetizing to us. That's the difficulty of sin. That's why it is so difficult not only for us to overcome, but it's so difficult for us to even overcome the temptation because Satan takes our own desires and he makes the sins that come along with that look appetizing to us. He takes our desires and then in his craftiness, he makes us believe that fulfilling those desires is what's going to bring us joy. He makes us believe that if we will fall into that, if we will fulfill those desires, then the sin that comes along with that, that is what will bring us ultimate fulfillment. And that is why sin is so difficult. That's why sin is so deceitful, because Satan takes our own desires and he tempts us with those things. And it's because of the deceitfulness and the destructiveness of sin and the power of Satan that sin is so difficult to overcome. Now, maybe you are feeling the effects of sin right now. Maybe you are caught up in that what feels like a a never-ending web of sin right now. Maybe you're feeling its effects of, of your own sin or the effects of someone else's sin. Maybe you can remember back to a time where there was that sin in your life that was separating you from your relationship with God. See, sin when it takes hold of our lives, when it takes control of us, when Satan enticing us and tempting us with our own desires, when he takes control of us, it leaves us asking the question, how can I get through this? How can I have the power to overcome this? And that question is exactly what I want us to ask ourselves this evening. In the face of sin, in the face of me being lured and enticed by my own desire, I want us to ask the question, how can we overcome? What can we do to overcome the power of Satan? How can we overcome the power of sin? And I really want this to be encouraging to us tonight because I believe with my whole heart that we can overcome sin. Even in its difficulties, even when it takes hold of us and we feel like that we could never get through it, I want us to understand that Scripture teaches us that we can overcome. We can overcome sin. We can overcome the power of Satan. The the, the heavy weight of sin doesn't have to weigh us down forever. So this evening I want us to see how and why we can overcome And I want us to, we're going to look at two different reasons why Scripture teaches us that we can undoubtedly overcome the power of sin. And the truth is, as you can imagine, both of these reasons that we're going to look at tonight are all enveloped in one thing. They are all tied up in one person. See, the reason that we can overcome sin, truly overcome it, not just kick the habit for a little while, but truly overcome our sin is because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed Himself so that all mankind could be saved. That is why we can have the power to overcome, because we have Jesus. All of what we are talking about tonight can be tied up in that, that we have Jesus. And so the first reason that I want us to see that we can overcome sin, the first thing I want us to look at tonight, is that we can overcome sin Because Scripture teaches us that Jesus serves as our great high priest. If you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is what we'll look at for this. And as a reminder to you, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of, of Jewish Christians, of Christians who had converted from Judaism to Christianity. And the problem for them was that over time, they had grown weary in their faith. Their faith, for whatever reason, was difficult for them. The Hebrews writer kind of gets into that about the difficulties that they were facing, and he writes this to them to be an encouragement to them, to be an encouragement to them to keep going, to keep, as he says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, running with endurance the race that was set before them. The Hebrews was written as an encouragement to these Christians. But I'll be honest with you, there is a a verse in chapter 4 that I think is a very sobering verse. It can be a very scary verse for us. Read with me what is said in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. 
Actually, we'll, we'll jump back to, to verse 12, read 12 and 13 together. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that's what the word of God does as a two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Then look at what he says in verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I don't know about you, but to me that that is really sobering. The fact that there is no way to be hidden from God. There is no way for the things that we have done, for the sins that we have committed, for the ways that we have fallen into our temptations before God, there's no way for those to be hidden. But as a matter of fact, Scripture teaches us that all are naked and exposed to His eyes, to God's eyes. And we, standing before Him naked and exposed, we have to give an account for all of the things that we have done. And let me tell you, If that verse were by itself, if that was where the thought ended, that would be really, really, really scary. But it doesn't have to be scary at all. Because look at what comes next, starting in verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we, do not ha- for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So in verse 13, The writer says that we were were exposed. We are exposed, we are naked before God, having to give an account for all of the things that we have done. Okay, so we we have that thought in verse 13. And then you jump down three verses to verse 16, and he tells us to draw near to the throne of grace. He says to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. So how in the world can I, exposed before God, as verse 13 says, draw near to the throne of God with confidence? How can that happen? Because of what we see in verses 14 and 15, because we have Jesus, because we have a great high priest. And because, as the writer says in verse 14, we have a great, or verse 15 rather, we have a great high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. How can he do that? How can Jesus sympathize with us in our weaknesses? Because, as the passage tells us, in every respect, he has been tempted just like me. Church, this passage should bring us absolute confidence and peace. We find two really important things here in this passage that I think can provide us with that confidence, that can provide us with that peace in the face of sin, in the face of temptation. First, it's that our Savior sympathizes with us. How how amazing is that, that that we have a Savior who not only died for us, but He also sympathizes with us. And so when you read things like in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, When you read that, I I don't want you to read that lightly. I would like for you to go back and read that at some point. And when you do so, don't just read it lightly. It would be really easy because we know how the story turns out, because we know that Jesus never did sin, for us to look at at Matthew chapter 4 and to think about Jesus and say, well, of course he didn't sin. He He was Jesus. Of course not. It would be easy for us to look throughout the life of Jesus and think that it was so easy for him to get through life without sin. But what we have to remember is that Jesus took on the form of a human. And you think about all of the temptations that you go through in your life that are so difficult sometimes to overcome. Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted like us in every respect. And so because of that temptation that Jesus went through, because throughout his life he was tempted in every respect like us, he knows exactly what we're going through. 
when you are facing a temptation that feels impossible to get through. When, when you are looking at your own sin and you are thinking, how can I ever get through this? You can have hope because your Savior, Jesus Christ, understands. And He sympathizes with you because He's been through it too. Because He has been through the same sort of temptations. And so we have a Savior who sympathizes with us. That's why we can have peace. That's why we can have confidence. And then second... Jesus overcame those temptations, and now he offers us grace. That last bit of verse 15, where the writer says, yet without sin, that's paramount for our faith. That, that is so important for the Christian faith, because you see the reason that we can have confidence in what is said in verse 16 the reason that we can have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need is because even though Jesus was tempted, He never sinned. Because even though He was tempted in every respect like us, He never sinned, yet without sin, as the writer says. And because Jesus was without sin, because He did not cave into those temptations and because He was sacrificed as, as a perfect person, we can now approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive God's mercy and God's grace. And so overall, the first reason that we can absolutely have hope to overcome our sin to overcome our temptation is because we have Jesus that serves as our great high priest. And then the second overall thing that I want us to look at tonight is that we can overcome our temptations. We can overcome our sins because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. To me, one of the most amazing things about our salvation. One of my favorite things to think of when it comes to the gospel message of Jesus and the salvation that we are offered is that when we are baptized into Christ, when we choose to become followers of Jesus, we then become identified by the righteousness of Christ. And that's so important, so I want to say it again. When you make the decision to follow Jesus... When you become a follower of Jesus, you are then identified by the righteousness of our Savior, of Jesus Christ. As followers of Jesus, we are no longer identified by our imperfections. We are no longer identified by our sins. We are no longer identified by our own righteousness, but instead we are identified by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, I love this verse. Paul says this, he says, For he made him, or for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you understand what he says there? He says, For our sake, for my sake, he made him, God made Jesus to be sin, even though he knew no sin. And why did He do that? So that in Him, so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not identified by your sin. You are not identified by any enslavement to sin because you are no longer enslaved to sin. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are able to put on the righteousness of God so that you are no longer identified by your own imperfections, by your own shortcomings, but instead you are identified by the righteousness of God. That is the amazing grace of Jesus Christ that is offered to us and that is why we can have hope to overcome. Because we are not trusting in our own righteousness. We are not trusting in our own perfection. We are not trusting in things that we can do. Instead, we are trusting in the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, Satan is powerful. Sin is, is deceiving. It is destructive. And once it takes hold of us, it is hard to overcome it. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is stronger. Jesus is more 
powerful. And Jesus has already overcome Satan. He has already overcome sin. He has already overcome death. As powerful as sin is on our lives, as much as it can take hold of us, Jesus is even more powerful than that. So how can we overcome? How can we overcome our sin? Because we have Jesus. As we close tonight, will you pray with me? Our God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all of the things that you do for us. Lord, we are thankful for the love that you have for us, first and foremost, that, that allowed you to send your Son to this earth so that we could be saved, so that we wouldn't have to trust in our own righteousness because we know that we would have fallen that. Lord, but we are so thankful for your grace that is offered through the sacrifice of your Son. Lord, we're thankful that you give us an opportunity to follow you. And we pray, Lord, that those who, who do not follow you, who have not made the decision to follow you, will make that decision to be able to receive your grace, to be able to trust in the righteousness of, of you and of Jesus rather than their own righteousness. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice and everything that that sacrifice does for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.